Good morning. It's good to see you all. I'm uh, Pastor Chad. I'm the missions pastor here at FBC, and I'm so excited to get to be with you this morning. We have a lot going on in our church and a lot going on even this Sunday morning. Uh, and just so you know, uh, there's a couple things we're going to do even before we jump into the sermon. The first thing I want to do is I want to tell you that we have a mission team heading out this week to Moldova. And so we're going to show you a picture. I don't know if the Turleys are here. I know that the Hilgemeyers are over in their, um, their class but let's, uh, let's just take just a moment and let's pray for them. We're going to have them come up in the next service when they're all four here. Uh, but we just take a minute and let's ask the Lord to bless them as they go out this coming week and, uh, and head over there to Moldova. There's a picture of them if you don't know who they are. Um, Mark and Linda and Greg and Lisa. Let's pray for them. Father God, we thank you so much for the many ways that you're using FBC. God, we thank you for all the mission teams that have already gone out this summer. And God, the salvations that have happened, the good relationships, the churches that have been strengthened and encouraged. And God, we pray that you would be with these two families as they go this coming week and visit with our partners there in Moldova. Protect them in their travel. God, give them just incredible favor uh, with the leaders that they interact with, with the families that they see. God, we pray that there would be people come to faith as a result of this trip. God, you are moving in our world, and we are so thankful to get to be a part of it. Be with these families as they go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. There's so much happening. You know, this is a, a big weekend, 4th of July weekend. In fact, uh, this is one of the Sundays when missions pastors and youth pastors get to preach every year. Um, <laughs> Garrett knows what I'm talking about back there. Uh, we're so excited. This has been a ton of fun uh, over the last two weeks. I want to just take a moment and recognize our interns. So, uh, that, I don't know if you guys were here last Sunday, and this whole place was, was blanketed with all kinds of decorations. Um, we have an amazing staff that has been working so hard to prep for VBS, but those interns carried a whole lot of the weight and the load. I see a bunch of you over there. Guys, we appreciate you. This stage looks like normal. Um, and so thank you so much for all of your work, all that you guys did this last week. I know we had 200 volunteers. It was incredible. We're so appreciative of all that you guys did. And uh, I could get sidetracked and not get into our message if I'm not careful. So we're going to, we'll stop there. You know, this is 4th of July. We celebrate freedom every year at 4th of July. And like, like Will said just a few minutes ago, we can be so thankful that we live in a country that celebrates freedom, that celebrates bravery, that we've had really centuries of people who have been willing to sacrifice to protect those freedoms for us. But none of them are more important than the freedom we have to serve and seek Christ daily. You know, that's really the foundation of our country. This getting away from the oppressive nature of the state-controlled church in Europe so that we could worship God in our own way and seek him without having to be worried about what the government was going to say or not say. And so every moment of every day, we should be thankful that God has given us the freedoms we have in this country because there are many places in the world where that just is not the case. We're going to talk about today as we look into the message of the freedoms that God has given us and the freedoms we have. Uh, we're going to get to the end where it says there is neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free or male or female. And you see that in Christ, all of the distinctions that separate us are, are, are taken away. And every one of us, regardless of our station, regardless of our gender, regardless of, of, of our race, can pursue Christ with all that we are. And that's really where we're going to end today. Before we uh, get into the sermon, last thing is I want you to know we're going to end our service today with the Lord's Supper. And so when you came in, if you didn't get a chance to get the elements, the, the cup and the, the juice, will you raise your hand so our deacons can make sure that you guys get it? Uh, I want you to have it when we get to the end. And so uh, they're walking around right now. And, uh, and so let, let's jump into our message today. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever had an experience where you knew God was speaking to you in a unique and meaningful way? What was it like? What was it like in those moments when you thought and you believed that the God of the universe split time and was speaking to you directly? Was that a meaningful moment? Do you remember that moment? Does, does that moment come back to you over and over and over again? How many of you have never had a moment like that? There's some people that don't believe God cares enough to speak to us directly. And yet we're pursuing him daily, believing that he not only cares about us, but he wants to be in relationship with us. The Old Testament talked about those moments. They called them an Ebenezer type of moment. They would erect a, an altar when something important happened so that when they walked past that stack of stones, they would remember what God did in that moment. 
There's even songs that here I raise my Ebenezer. That's what it means. It's like, I want to remember what God has done in the past. And I wonder in our own walk today, how often we remember what God has done and what he's doing. It's so quick in our culture to move on to the next biggest and best thing. But how important is this for us to remember when God speaks? It doesn't happen necessarily every day. But in those moments when God does something special, he, he splits time and he says, you need to hear this. And we hear it and know it and know his voice. Jesus said, you know my voice, they hear my voice and they follow me. That's what we're looking for. And those are those moments that we're pursuing. And that's what we're going to talk about today. There was this huge moment in the life of, of Paul's missionary journeys where God did something unique and he split time and spoke to him in a unique and special way. Many of us probably remember the day that Jesus became our Lord and Savior. Those are those moments where something happens. For me, it was at a camp, a little camp in Arkansas called Rock Haven Bible Camp in a little town called Hasty, Arkansas. My dad sent me because one of our friends was going and he thought it would be a good place for me to go. When that missionary was talking about how God changed lives in Africa, I thought maybe he could change lives in Arkansas as well. And in that moment, when I asked God into my heart, it was like my heart was set on fire. And I knew that I was never going to be the same. And, and I've gone through all kinds of ups and downs since that moment in fifth grade. But he's always been constant and real and present. And I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt that that moment when he came into my life, my life was never the same. There have been other moments when I felt like God spoke to me, but I just want you to remember, I want you to hold on today to that moment when God did something unique and special inside of you. And if that's never happened for you, I want you to be thinking about it today, because maybe today is the moment where God will split time and speak directly to your heart. And so listen to these words. Another one of those moments for me was in Seattle. I was a missions pastor when I went on a mission trip uh, to, to um, to Mexico, I flew to Houston and my father-in-law and my mother-in-law, they happened to be here today. Um, it may be the moment that Roger regrets the most was driving to that Houston airport and picking me up that day. Uh, they said I looked like a junior high kid with a tank top on and my shark tooth necklace and I was so pumped you're going back to Texas that had a South Padre Island on, uh, t-shirt on. And uh, a couple years later we had been married and we were living in Seattle and we just felt the Lord speaking to us. There was a, a children's home that my father-in-law and, and family had been working with for all these years, and they were having some trouble. We felt God had called us to go. Our life in Seattle was a good life. We had a home. We had a good job. We had people that loved us, and we had a good opportunities in ministry. But we knew so clearly that it was God calling us that we resigned from our ministry. We raised money for almost a year to go, and we drove 2,300 miles from Seattle all the way down to Mexico and lived there for a couple years. Why would you do something like that unless you were sure that God was doing something unique and special? So I want to tell you, this is what happens in our story today. Paul has a plan, and his plan keeps getting disrupted. You heard Jason talk about it last week, that he wanted to go north into Bithynia, and the Lord closed that door. It says the Holy Spirit prevented them from going, and then he was going to go south to Ephesus. I think that was the primary focus of his journey. He wanted to get to Ephesus, and it says the Holy Spirit prevented them from going, and so they end up in Troas. That was the end. That's where, where, where Jason ended his sermon last week, where the they traveled across Galatia and that whole part of, of, of um, Asia Minor, and then it became we, because Luke joined them there in Troas. The author of the book of Acts joined them in Troas. And then there's this moment. Paul has this vision. And in the vision, there's a man in Macedonia who says, come over here. And they believe that that was the Lord speaking to them in this really powerful and miraculous way. And so they immediately leave from Troas and go across the sea there and end up in a town called Philippi, which is where our story is going to start today. So let's, uh, let's open up with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for your word. And we pray, Lord, that as we read and think about this story, as we think about the implications in our lives, we pray, God, that you'll be glorified in it. We pray, Lord, that you would lay our hearts bare and, God, that you would speak to us, that you would open up time and space. And God, that you would be here with us in every way. I pray that there would be no person here today that wouldn't know your spirit is alive and close and accessible, Father. Be with us in your name we pray. Amen. 
Amen. So turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 16. We're going to start in verse 11. And we're going to just kind of walk through this story. There's a lot to it. Uh, as I read through and prepared for this message, I really thought this could be three or four separate messages today. And so we're going to get a really quick overview of several different key components of this story. But it is a powerful story. And so we're going to move through it relatively quickly. So if you look at me at Acts 16, starting in verse 11, it says, From Troas we put out to sea and sailed straight for Simmonthrace. The next day we went on to Neapolis, and from there we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony in a leading city of the district of Macedonia. We stayed there several days. Verse 13, on the Sabbath, we went outside the city to a gate, uh, outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from Thyatira named Lydia. A dealer in purple cloth, she was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Now, you've probably heard this story before. Is this new to you guys? No, well, if, you, if this is the first time, this is a really monumental moment that we can pro- cross by. So when they cross from Troas to Philippi, it's the first time in Scripture that the gospel enters a new continent. Do you realize that? They're going from Asia Minor, now they're going over into Europe. And the first convert in the continent of Europe is this woman named Lydia. And it's a really remarkable thing when you think about all that would happen through the work of of European churches for the next millennia. The first Christian in Europe is this lady named Lydia. Never mentions her husband in the whole story. Multiple places that we hear about Lydia. It seems that she may have been a widow or maybe she was never married. She's a dealer in purple cloth, it tells us here. So she's a business lady and apparently a fairly successful business lady. She has control over her own home. She has her own household. Um, She doesn't have to ask permission for someone to stay there. She offers the invitation and persuades Paul. Now, there's some unique things about this whole story. One of them is that Paul in Thessalonica and other places refuses the generosity of people because he doesn't want them to question his motives. Think about this, when Paul went into a city, if people started to give him money or invite them to live in their house, they might think that the only reason he is doing these things is so that he can get from them what he needs to survive. And so oftentimes in Thessalonica, he says, I never took a dime from you when he's writing the book of Thessalonians. He said, I paid for my own way and even more. But here in Philippians, in Philippi, this woman is able to, 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 to so encourage Paul that he accepts her generosity and her home becomes the place where the church of Philippi meets. What an incredible thing. I want to just give you a few few things. So she's the first believer in in Europe. She's a wealthy dealer. She's single, like I said. And she's the perfect person of peace. You might remember uh, several months ago, I gave a sermon and we were talking about this idea of the person of peace. Who is it that God uses to open up a community to the gospel? So the person of peace has three or four different um, uh, traits, I would say. So the first one is they welcome the messenger. The second one is they welcome the message. And lastly, they welcome the mission of God. And so I, I, we, have a, we can have a whole sermon. If you listen to the podcast we've been doing, the So That podcast, we talk a, a whole, one of the whole sessions about this idea of the person of peace. And I ask the question, are you the person of peace? Are you the person who has welcomed the messenger of God? Are you the person that has welcomed the message of God? And are you the person who welcomes the mission of God in your life? I find that many believers like the first two, but don't like the third one. <laughs> They like the messenger and they like the message, but they don't really want to partner in the mission. And this person, this Lydia, shows that she does all three really well in just a few verses. Look at the, look at the impact here. When she and her members of her household were baptized, it's not just that she gave her life to Christ, but everyone that lived close to her, everyone that was in her oikos, if you think about that Greek word, we talked about this when we went through uh, the story of Cornelius. The idea that when a person came to faith, oftentimes their entire network of friendships and the people that lived within their family and household uh, would come to faith as well. And so we see the same thing here in the life of Lydia. Think about this. In a time when women's authority and influence was at an all-time institutional low, Lydia stands as a powerful example of the impact of women throughout the history of the church. Jesus and Paul elevated and recognized the role of women throughout their ministries. 
Just consider this, Lydia is the first believer in Philippi. She hosts the church in her home. She cares for Paul and his team by providing for their lodging and their meals and even contributes to the work financially and for the gospel through them. Do you know the entire book of Philippians is written as a thank you note to the church in Philippi? The entire book, there's a whole book of Paul saying thank you because they gave sacrificially and abundantly multiple times throughout his ministry career. And so he writes a book to them saying, I thank God every time I think of you. When you read that book of Philippians, you should think that it's literally written to Lydia and the church there in Philippi. What a powerful moment. Alan Hirsch, uh, a church planter and writer, uh, wrote this recently in an email chain that I'm a part of. He said, it's absolutely clear throughout the New Testament that women are given equal agency in the kingdom. They are fully identified with Christ through his death and resurrection. As such, they can say to that mountain, move, and it will move. They're also called to go, and they are also sent to make disciples. Every genuine moment, movement of Christianity in history is full of the contribution, and in many cases, the leadership of women. You know, this has been a really controversial thing, even within the Southern Baptist Church, just over the last couple of months. Uh, there was a, a big vote in New Orleans just a few weeks ago that <laughs> continues to make ripples throughout our country, throughout our convention, throughout the denomination, and really any Southern Baptist entity is dealing with this in some small form or some major forms. Um, but what's interesting is even within our tradition, the Southern Baptist tradition, women have played a major role. Do you know every major missions fundraiser is, raised after, is named after an amazing woman missionary from the field? Have you ever heard of the Christmas fundraiser called Lottie Moon? Yeah, Lottie Moon is an amazing single woman that God sent uh, to the mission field and she impacted tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of lives. Do you know, have you heard of the Annie Armstrong Easter offering? Annie Armstrong is another tremendous example of people who planted churches and did great things in God's name. Those are just a few names among the many. We could go on and on with the, the, the Ira Scudder or the, the Amy Carmichaels of the world. There are tens of thousands. In fact, you know that 55% of our mission force is women? It's unbelievable to me that we continue to struggle with what agency women can carry or not carry. Even with such an amazing history and the legacy of women's calling and contributions, the topic of this uh, women's roles in the Southern Baptist Church continues to be a lightning rod. Over the last six months, the, the SBC infighting over these issues has, has been overwhelming. Take a few minutes and look up SBC Twitter if you want to <laughs> jump into the fight. It's, it's wild. I want to take a moment and just speak to the ladies in our church. Ladies, you are fully formed disciple makers. You lack nothing. You have full and direct access to Jesus Christ himself. And therefore, you are his ambassadors, as Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 5. With Christ as your king, you lack nothing. At FBC, I would venture in many other churches, you carry the heavy load in our ministries. Without your constant service, your organization, your leadership, and our committees, your assistance in caring situations, we would not be able to function. We are so thankful for your contributions and all of the ladies in this church, all that you do. If you were here this week for VBS, I don't know what the statistic was, but there were ladies in every single part of our ministry this week. And I just want you to know we are so thankful for you and all that you do. And guys, I'm not trying to leave you out. We know that you also contribute powerfully in so many different ways. But today, I just want you to take a moment and think through and recognize the contribution of ladies in your life. If you were to hang around my home for very long, you would know what a disaster it would be if my wife wasn't in it. <laughs> and I would just expect that many of our families are in the same space. For, you, for those of you men who serve alongside women ministry, make sure you take the time this week to recognize and value and express your gratefulness for their work in your world. If we can continue in this letter, uh, we can see, listen to Paul's letter to the Philippians. This is such a powerful thing. Think about who he's writing this letter to when he says this in Philippians 2, 1 through 4. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united in Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and of one mind. 
Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking for your own interests, but each of you looking to the interests of others. These words that Paul wrote to the Philippians should unite us to remain in Christ, one body made up of men and women. We need each of you. As one missionary has said, it will take the whole church to reach the whole world. I like that amen right there, Chopper. And so here we are, the church in in Philippi, the church in Europe starts in Lydia's home with her entire household coming to faith. Paul and his team, as usual, begin to minister in the public places around Philippi. And as usual, it doesn't doesn't take long for the gospel to meet danger and incredible opposition. This is really the process you see in Paul's ministry walk. He he normally goes into a city and goes straight to the synagogue. Philippi didn't have a synagogue. It didn't have that Jewish population that he normally would interact with first. So he goes to the river to find people who pray. Apparently, rivers were sacred places, and so people who loved God and prayed would go there. So that's where Paul went. That was the, the version of the synagogue there in Philippi. From there, he goes to the marketplace and begins preaching the gospel to anyone and everyone who will listen. And if you know the story, this turns disastrous relatively quickly. So listen to this. We go from Lydia, an influential businesswoman, to another girl, another female in this story. So listen, we're in verse 6. So when we, were going from place to, to, when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had, the spirit, had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God, who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept us up for many days, and finally Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the Spirit left her. What an incredible story. So this is the second named, unnamed, believer in all of Europe. (laughs) is a slave girl. Think about this, the idea here. God cares about the single business lady and he cares about this slave girl that is in bondage to a spirit and owned by owners. Can you get any further spectrum here? God cares about them both. Think about that missionary call. Remember when Paul was in Troas and God said he had a vision of a man saying, come on over here. These are the people that God is calling Paul and his team to minister to. First, to Lydia and her family, and second, to this slave girl. Look at verse 19. When her owners realized that the hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar. They're angry because they've lost some money. By advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice, Verse 22 continues, the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, I always underline the word severely. (laughs) Like a flogging sounds bad enough, but it was severely flogged. They were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in stocks. A lot is happening in this story. But let's just take a moment and look at the parallels between Lydia and this slave girl. We could have titled this message The Tale of Two Girls, The Tale of Two Ladies, or something like that. And you really see this this comparison because both are valuable to God. At the beginning of the story, we don't even know who they are. And at the end of the story, God has done incredible things to give them access to the gospel. Lydia is a merchant, the girl is a fortune teller. Both are lost as the story starts. Both are important to Paul's ministry and impact uh, the world around them. And both are delivered from darkness into light through this story. We never hear the girl's name, but it's clear that God has delivered this girl from her oppressive spirit. We don't know what happens to her. I even tried to look in church history, was there any rumor or legend about what she did next? And there's just nothing. There's no information of what happens to her after the story. I like to think that maybe she was involved in the church in some form. Maybe that she got invited to Lydia's church. Maybe she got invited into Lydia's home and got to serve God together with them, but there's just no record of that. In this story, we have have two different ladies that, that Paul ministers to and miraculously saves. 
The scriptures, again, don't tell us what happens to her, but it got Paul and Silas into a lot of trouble. Have you ever been beaten severely? It seems like this is fairly commonplace in Paul's ministry. And isn't it interesting that God sometimes is willing to wreck the lives of his servants to reach the lives of the lost? Isn't that an interesting thing? So verse 20, it says, they brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews. They're throwing our city into an uproar. Uh, Some reason I repeated this already. So here we go. (laughs) Here's the funny thing. We're halfway through our message. We're only halfway into the story. These two incredible stories about Lydia, the story of the slave girl. So keep going with me here now in verse 25. At midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Now, nobody raised their hand when I asked you if you'd ever been flogged or beaten, much less severely. But if you imagine that you had been, how do you think you would feel that evening? What kind of questions would be going through your heart and mind? Would you be asking God, do you even remember us, Lord? Did you even know this happened? Were you with us when we heard that call from Macedonia? Were you with us when we we answered the call to come here and now we're sitting in prison, locked in our feet, in the inner cell, like it's almost like isolation. You're You're in the unique space reserved for the worst people. And what are these guys doing? Are they depressed and angry and upset at the Lord? What's it say they're doing? Singing praises. They're doing what we did this morning. How bad was your week? How good was your week? Ours was fantastic. We had an amazing week. We were so excited to see all that God did. Coming here this morning and praising God is a very easy thing in my life. But could you imagine Paul and Silas' situation? So at midnight, they're singing hymns, and look at verse 26. Suddenly, there's such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prisons were shaken. All at once, the prison doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. Verse 27, the jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison's doors open, he, threw his, he withdrew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted to him, don't harm yourself. We are all here. I don't know about the other prisoners. You think they were like, hey, why are we staying? Like, I get it, Paul and Silas are honorable men. What about these other guys? They stayed as well. So the jailer calls for lights. He rushes in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He brought them out and he asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? So think about this. I asked you at the beginning, has there ever been a moment where God just broke through time and space and made himself known to you? In this story, we have four of them already. We have the vision for Paul and Silas and his team that happened when they were in Troas. We have Lydia hearing the voice of God through the sermon of Paul coming to faith in all of her household. We have the slave girl responding to the voice of Paul, calling the spirit out of of her and her coming a believer in Christ. And then now you have this jailer who saw God do something so incredible that an earthquake split open the prison and now he is asking what must I do to be saved four moments in these few verses where God split open time and showed up in a very powerful way in the lives of these people and it forever changes them amen Amen. what an incredible thing that Jesus does when he speaks into people's lives It's an amazing story that Paul and Silas are not just, they're not discouraged, but they're seeking God and worshiping him for their difficult times. It reminds me of that verse in James that Paul probably knew in this moment where it says, consider it pure joy, brothers, when you encounter trials of many kind, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. What an incredible picture So let's just kind of run through this. They were beaten and placed in the inner cell. They sang praises to God late into the night. The earthquake happens and releases them and the other prisoners. Paul and Silas, they chose not to escape, apparently with the other inmates. The jailer seeks salvation. And early in the night, the jailer tends to their wounds. Let's continue here in the the story. Verse 31, it says, They replied to him when he asked, What must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your Household, You have the same word. There it is again. It's the oikos word that talks about his network of friends and relationships. 
They spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his home. And at that hour of the night, what hour was it? Midnight, some of you guys are paying attention. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Listen to this. And immediately, he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his home and set a meal before them. And he was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. What an incredible moment. Man, when God came into Europe, he came into Europe with a flurry, didn't he? He just kind of blasts through the doors and, and man, does some incredible things. And these stories were told throughout the entire region. And guess what happened? The church in Philippi began to grow. And the believers in the region began to be encouraged because of what God was doing. And these first fruits of faith there took on a responsibility that, that stayed for years and years and years. If you go to, to uh, Turkey today and you go to the ancient part where Troas and, and Macedonia, you can find these places where church history says these churches met. What an incredible thing that God was doing. What an amazing story. Consider this with me, the willingness of God to reach every person. In this story, we have a jailer, we have a slave girl, and we have Lydia, a wealthy businesswoman. What an incredible thing that God has done. He called Paul out of Asia Minor specifically to reach out to these people. You know, this is an important moment. We talk about freedom in our world. Do you know that we have been given unbelievable freedoms, but not everybody has those freedoms. Uh, this, this week on July the 4th, there's a video being released. Uh, you might have seen some of the things on Facebook. It's about human trafficking and child trafficking, and it's a really scary story. I think it's called The Sound of Freedom. It's going to be in theaters on, on, uh, on Tuesday. But the whole focus is about two million kids around the world that are in some, some form of slavery. And it's a horrible reality. And it really makes you wonder, does God care? How can these things happen in these, these terrible environments? Uh, I was talking to a, one of our church members this week via email and just talking about the, the, the slavery, the, the child slavery, the human slavery, the, the human trafficking, the drug trafficking, the, 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 the weapon trafficking. They're all horrible. How do you even begin to fight those kind of battles? If you then throw in things like the war in Ukraine, or you throw in starvation in Ethiopia and, and Sudan, you throw in other huge evils that are killing people around our world, how do you even begin to impact them? And I want to tell you, it's crushing. If you start to realize if we took all of the money that's ever given to our church and put it towards one of those things, it wouldn't stop it. If we took everything that we had collectively in this room and we gave it towards one of those things, it might do a little bit. I worked along the border in, in Mexico, uh, right on in Texas border for the last 10 years. And, and all of our effort to try to care for and, and assist these people who are coming by the tens of thousands trying to get into the United States. They're, they're backed up into Mexico and, and they struggle just to make ends meet. They're in really rough, and they're living in cartel controlled environments. It's a very difficult place they live in. And you realize all of our effort barely, barely makes a dent in any of the need. How do you face that kind of reality with hope. And it really is simple. It actually is right in our scriptures today that God cares about every single one of them. And the best thing we can do to recognize the dignity that every single person has been given is to seek the gospel for every one of them. You know the hope for a trafficker is the gospel. The hope for these really bad people that do these really bad things is the gospel. It can transform their lives like it transformed Paul's life. The guy that was the persecutor of the church is now being beaten for taking the gospel into places and singing praises in the prisons. If you want to see bad people redeemed, we have to get the gospel into their hands. And so the work to take the gospel and make disciples among all the nations is the answer. It's just we can't get it far enough, fast enough. And some people will reject it. We know that. But the hope of the world is Jesus Christ in every form. And the hope of the world is his people responding to his call, like Paul did in this story. I want to finish as we look at a couple of verses, one from Galatians. 
Um, by this time in the story, Paul has already written the book of Galatians, and he said this to them, Galatians chapter 3, starting verse 26, it says, For you are all sons and daughters of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. Think about the story we've read today. It includes every one of those aspects. Jews and Gentiles, slaves and free, males and females, all of them matter to God. And in this story, it's very clear how much they matter. So when you get to the book of the Philippians, Paul's letter to the Philippian church, the church in Philippi, it's hosted in Lydia's house. Look with me here at Philippians chapter one, verse three through six. It says, I thank my God every time I remember you. This is Paul's words later, writing back to them. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion, completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Do you remember who Paul was talking to when he wrote these words? What were the faces and names in his heart and mind when he was writing it? Lydia, a slave girl, and a jailer. <laughs> it's just what the church is. So here's my question today. If God is willing to wreck his own people's lives in order to reach the lost, what is he calling you to do today? What is the mission he's calling you to that will cost you something? What is the mission that, that's gonna cause some sacrifice in your heart and life? Because I feel like that's always where the battle is. You might remember the story where David was, was gonna um, purchase some property to, to build an altar and the guy said, no, 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 I'm just gonna give it to you. And Paul said, no, a Peter, a J <laughs> how many different people can I name trying to say David? David said, no, because I'm not going to give to the Lord a sacrifice that costs me nothing. What is it that God is calling you to do? And if you were to be faithful to that calling, what could it look like? What is it that God wants to do through us? So here we are. Um, we're going to ask the worship team to come up, and I just have a few things for you guys to think about as we close. First of all, if you're a woman and you felt undervalued by the world, undervalued in the church, and I would tell you, cast your cares upon Christ. He is the only one that could fulfill you in every way. Our institutions are broken, guys. We're broken people. We do our best, but it's not perfect, and it won't be perfect until the day that Christ returns. If you're a leader, encourage those around you, men and women, and see that God has called all of us to respond to his word with faithfulness. And today, if you've never had a moment where you knew God was speaking to you, let that day change now. If you're far from God and you feel like these extraordinary things we're talking about are just are not familiar to you, then today is the day to surrender your life and welcome him as king. Here in the next few moments, we're going to take the Lord's Supper. And so I want you to get out your elements and, and be thinking like, like uh, you hear often here, uh, we're supposed to purify our hearts as we remember Christ's death and resurrection. And what a better moment today, looking at this story, to remember all that Christ has done for us. So I'm going to give you just a moment, just a moment to seek God. Ask him to unveil anything in your heart that you've hidden from him. Take a moment to get your heart right before him. I'll give you just some seconds here in silence. First Corinthians 11, verse 23, it says, For I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
Let's take the bread together. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take this together. If today... You want someone to talk to you, you want to pray. So we sing this song, guys. You can come to the front, you can pray where you are. If you've never asked Jesus to be the king of your life and you want to make a change today, come down and talk to me. There'll be some other prayer leaders right up here. Feel free to talk to them. And don't let another moment pass without making him the king of your life. And then would you guys stand with us and let's sing together?